Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first event uh, from the Carolina Center for Jewish Studies. Uh, my name is Ruth von Bernus, and I'm the director of the center. Um, this topic uh, for tonight um, is very special to for myself for myself personally. An aunt of mine worked as a psychiatrist in East Germany, and her dissertation was about victims and actually how the, um, uh, the continuancy of the so-called euthanasia. And so she actually wor worked and met nurses and doctors who continued to work in the psychiatric ward uh, after uh, 1945 in Brandenburg in, um, uh, near Berlin. So therefore I grew up uh, with this topic. This was heavily discussed in my family and Therefore, I'm very uh, grateful that Patricia Heber Rice uh, agreed to join us for tonight's lecture. Uh, she joined uh, the Holocaust Museum in Washington in 1994 and is now the museum's senior historian. And there she serves as a specialist on medical crimes and hygienic pol policies in Nazi Germany. And um, I have met her at a conference and that's why I thought I really would wanted to like to bring her to one of our events. I'm really uh, sorry that we cannot have her in person, but we're still very grateful that you're here with us tonight. Thank you, Patricia, for being with us. Thank you, Ruth. It's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to be here with you all. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to come this evening, especially with that very sincere introduction. This is really an interesting history. Um, and let's unwrap it a bit. Um, as uh, Ruth, as Dr. von Bernot has said, I've been working at the museum for about 25 years as an historian, so I've had a lot of opportunity to talk about Nazi criminality. And if you look at most Nazi crimes, there's a common pattern with most of them. If you're looking at them in a very judicious light, you'll see that the majority of crimes that are associated with the Nazi regime tend to be committed by police or parapolice, police-like organizations, whether that's the Gestapo on the streets of Germany or German-occupied Europe, whether those are the guards, especially SS guards in the concentration camps like Dachau or in killing centers, as we like to refer to them at the museums like Auschwitz, or uh, those Einsatzgruppen, and those mobile, so-called mobile killing units moving behind the German army lines in places like the German occupied Soviet Union, murdering Jews and other civilians um, uh, right behind the German lines during World War II. But this story is a little different as uh, Dr. von Bernot uh, kind of suggests. This is a story about medicine and specifically about medicine misused, I think we can safely say abused, as state policy under a notorious dictatorship. The history of medicine, of medical crimes under Nazism, my purview, if you will, is kind of an understudied chapter in that history that's a mandate at our organization, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. I'm sitting tonight in Falls Church, Virginia in my house. I am not in Prague, um, but uh, coming to you from uh, the Washington area. And this story is kind of integral for helping us to understand how that tapestry, if anything so dark and ugly can be called a tapestry, how those threads of Nazi ideology and policy come together to become the Holocaust. And this is a very instructive history. So I think it's a story very much telling in this week of International Holocaust Remembrance. We all like to think, I, I suppose, that Madison is a progressive force, of course, a force for healing. We try to believe, hope to believe, that the ethics that underpin our Western medical profession are stable and enduring. But as we know, because we're all sitting here, and as, as Ruth said this evening with re reference to her own family's history and looking into these uh, tragedies, uh, the traditional concepts of medicine's core values, ethics, were profoundly shaken, were profoundly challenged in the 1930s and 1940s when medical professionals lent their know-how, their wisdom, their, um, their services, to the priorities and policies of the Nazi dictatorship. 
physicians, psychiatrists, nurses, public health officials participate in some of the most terrible crimes associated with the Third Reich. How is this so? Why is this so? How is it that a profession which we routinely trust to protect us and our welfare, and today we see as frontline heroes during this pandemic, how can they be involved in such grisly crimes? And some of the answer lies here. Uh, as you might be aware, in the 12 years that the Nazis are in power, the Nazi dictatorship targets lots of real and perceived enemies. These were pretty paranoid guys. Most of them were guys. Uh, and some of those real and perceived enemies we at the museum like to call um, enemies of belief and enemies of action. Enemies of belief are people like Jehovah's Witnesses, who, because of their beliefs that God uh, trumps temporal authorities, that they owe their allegiance not to the authority of the state, but to God, this brings them on a collision course with the Nazis. Enemies of action might be people who are in the resistance against the Nazis. Uh, so that what their actions bring them into conflict with the Nazis. But those individuals, those groups, that are targeted most stringently by the Nazis tend to be what we might see as biological enemies. Um, certainly, and most significantly Jews, also Roman Sinti, that's a term we prefer at the museum to the term gypsies, which is pejorative, uh, targeted for um, discrimination, persecution, uh, in some kind, in some, uh, particularly with the Jews, uh, deportation and systematic destruction. Yet even within what we consider, or the Nazis would have considered their racial community that they thought that they had constructed for themselves, there were some elements, there was a final element, there was a biological enemy inside, within that racial community, because certainly Jews and Romans and are outside that racial community as far as the Nazis are concerned and their believers are concerned. But that third biological enemy are the so-called hereditarily ill as the Nazis define them. Today, we call them with people with mental, social, or physical disabilities who the Nazi leaders argue make no significant contribution to their society while that existence places a genetic, that's important, a genetic as well as a financial uh, burden on that society and the state. And already in the early years, of Nazi power, Nazi authorities are all about dividing their community between what they thought were valuable and non-valuable members. And because so much of what it was to be valuable in Nazi Germany, racially valuable, socially valuable, had what we can consider biomedical implications. Uh, medical professionals, especially doctors, are in this very unique position to help the Nazi authorities partition their racial community into those valuable and non-valuable members. And they devise and implement what I like to call radical public health strategies to help the Nazis achieve some of their racial goals. And tonight, in the short time that I have with you, I wanna discuss two policies, racial policies, state policies, uh, which the Nazis were, uh, sorry, med the medical community in Nazi Germany were, uh, participating actively, both in so devising and implementing. The first is compulsory sterilization. It's a public policy put into place in the very early years of the Nazi regime and leading to that second more uh, dramatic course, uh, the second policy, the so-called euthanasia program, uh, a secret state-sponsored operation that targets for killing Germany's mentally and physically disabled patients living in institutional settings within the German border and within German annexed territories, territories like Alsace-Lorraine, uh, Austria, uh, the what is today the Czech lands, those places that were asked to Germany. And so when I say the word euthanasia today, I want you to see this word in quotation marks because this is not classical euthanasia in terms of assisted suicide, or as today we went, might also call assisted death, which is part of our bioethics debate in this country. Some states have those programs, some countries have assisted death. This is a cynical program of mass murder and about 250,000 uh, disabled patients with disabilities murdered during the war years. And that's really a significant portion 
of the institutionalized population at the time in Germany. This is the first program of Nazi mass murder. It precedes the genocide of European Jewry that we know of as the Holocaust of the Shoah uh, that we're commemorating this evening by about two years. So, so this all makes sense. Let's talk today a little bit about how and why doctors get involved with these policies in both devising them and implementing them. And thank you, Andrea, for uh, helping me with my PowerPoint. And I'm going to do this here. There we go. Um, first, let's see a little bit about the German medical community. Uh, Germany in the 1920s and 1930s is really at the forefront, just as the US is today, of the international medical community. Uh, in my place in Washington, DC, we have a very famous medical school to our north in Baltimore, Johns Hopkins University. It, is, it was the, um, in the late 19th, early 20th century, it was the model for medical schools throughout the United States. And it in turn was modeled after German medical faculties because they're at the vanguard of the international medical community. Uh, in terms of the medical sciences, in terms of research, things like cancer research. It's a German doctor in the 1930s and 40s who finds out that um, secondhand smoke can lead to lung cancer. Uh, they're ahead in terms of preventive medicine. Preventive medicine, preventing disease before you can get sick with it is very important, especially during this time because antibiotics and sulfa drugs are just being invented at this particular time. They come into general circulation at the end of World War II in places like the United States. And before you have something like an antibiotic like penicillin, preventive medicine is extremely important. Um, public health, in terms of public health, I just said that um, German uh, physicians in the 1930s and 1940s discover secondhand smoke can lead to lung cancer. And so what do the Nazis do as part of public policy? They're the first place that I know of anywhere that bans smoking in some public places. And if you think about when that comes to place and uh, takes place in the United States, that's relatively the 1990s. So they are very far ahead in terms of public health policies and medical research and things like this. That's these advantages in public health are for those people who are valuable, I should say, within um, the Nazis racial community. And unfortunately uh, for German doctors, this was also a community that was very quickly Nazified. Uh, the Nazis like to practice this policy of synchronization, which they called it, to synchronize or coordinate uh, professional organizations with their policies and with their ideologies. And unfortunately, with the German medical community, uh, they're extremely successful. 45% of physicians uh, in 1937, the first year of open membership for the Nazi party, are members of the Nazi party. That's the highest percentage in party membership per profession. That's not to say that all German doctors are Nazi doctors or that all Nazi doctors are, you know, all that members of the um, um, party are necessarily what we would sort of put into quotation Nazi doctors in scare quotes, but it does demonstrate that there was fertile ground for what I'd like to call these radical public health strategies among doctors, especially and public uh, professional uh, medical personnel in general. So this is a slide that shows, as you can see, the other part of the puzzle, why some physicians were willing to help uh, the Nazis with their policies had to do with the advent of eugenics. Uh, this was an international movement that really gains ground in the late, it's coined, the, the term eugenics is coined in the late 1890s by uh, English uh, naturalist and mathematician, Sir Francis Galton. The term means good birth in Greek, uh, and it really gains traction in the, in the, the last um, decade of the 19th century and the first decades of the 20th century. And the, at the core of the movement's belief system is the idea that human heredity is fixed and immutable, that it's nature, not nurture, that makes you the person who you are and determines whether you're going to make a contribution to your society or whether you're going to be on the public dole, dependent on public welfare. Uh, it gains grounds as an international movement with the advent of Darwinism, the ideas uh, of Darwin that Darwin helped popularize and 
uh, in the 1850s, the idea of natural selection and the origin of species, um, and takes shape, a sort of strange shape as social Darwinism, the ideas of Darwin applied to human behavior, ideas that Darwin would certainly not have continents. And it really gains traction around 1900 with the rediscovery of Mendelian genetics. So genetics as we know it. And the idea in, in a nutshell is this, if you can breed a better dog or a better horse as humankind has been doing for hundreds of thousands of years, you can breed a better person and a better national body. Um, eugenics as a national move, international movement, its heyday is really around right about 1913, 1914. So right about the before uh, World War I breaks out, the first World War. And at that time, uh, Great Britain, the United States and Germany are at the head of the international eugenics movement. Uh, that would have been the Kaiser's Germany in those days in 1913, 1914. The Nazis don't invent eugenics. Uh, but wherever eugenicists are, they want to employ these kind of tactics to better their societies through public measures. Uh, here in the United States, um, eugenics really kind of focuses on the color issue, trying to keep the white and black races from intermarrying what you might uh, what is called in this country anti-miscegenation laws that are on the books since colonial times uh, and are uh, kind of uh, undergirded during this and made stronger during this period through eugenicists efforts. And the other thing here, because we're a melting pot are the issues of immigration. And so you see the 1924 Johnson-Reed Act uh, as a eugenicist strategy. The Johnson-Reed Act is the first immigration law in the United States to make, uh, to give quotas uh, for immigration policy, large quotas for countries, for immigration from countries from Western Europe, like France, Germany, England, uh, the Scandinavian countries, and very small quotas for Southern and Eastern Europe, and very, very infinitesimal, tiny quotas for places like Asia. The essential idea in the United States was really to keep this a white Anglo-Saxon America. But wherever eugenicists were, they had some ideas in common. They wanted to find first who's valuable in their society and encourage these people to reproduce. Second, they wanted to find who's not valuable and discourage them from reproducing if necessary by sterilization. And that's where we are headed in Nazi Germany. Third, they want to divert human and material resources from the unworthy to the valuable. So that's really kind of a reverse of Judeo-Christian charity and the modern welfare state. Welfare and charity uh, try to support those who are vulnerable in the population with welfare or charity. But this is wrongheaded, say, eugenicists in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s. Those resources should be saved, preserved, for individuals who are already contrib uh, contributing to society. And four, we wanna keep the races from intermarrying. And if you think about, so we said this in relation to the American anti-miscegenation laws uh, that kept whites and blacks from marrying this country well into the 1960s in many states. But uh, in Nazi Germany, if you think back in your history lectures and your history classes, if you think back to the 1935 Nuremberg laws, those laws which are the basis for all subsequent um, anti-Semitic or anti-Jewish laws in Nazi Germany, one of those laws specifically was the law for the protection of German blood and German honor. And that, yes, absolutely that was an anti-Jewish law, an anti-Semitic law. There's no question about that. But it is also, if you look at it, it's also a eugenic law. And indeed, it's that mixture of, of um, the virulent anti-Semitism that the Nazis bring with them when they uh, come to power and their firm belief in eugenic aspects or aspects of the eugenic movement to be applied here. It's that, it's that intermingling between eugenics and anti-Semitism, racial anti-Semitism that the Nazis bring with them that provides such a lethal cocktail uh, when it comes to Nazi racial policy. 
Uh, and since we're interested in, and uh, here we see uh, one of our scarier moments, Hitler as, um, sorry, I lost my script here. Uh, second, oops. Sorry about that. I am missing, I just lost my script here for a second. Um, here you see a photograph of Adolf Hitler. Uh, and as the caption says, as a physician of the German people, uh, certainly a kind of a scary thought there. Uh, but it's um, when the Nazis come to power in 19, uh, 1940, uh, 1933, they really had the volition, the will to put those ideas into very concrete and radical forms. And certainly they do this in terms of, um, sorry about this, I've lost my place here. There we go, hold on a second. Um, uh -oh. There we go. There we go. Um, uh, so when they come to power in the 1930s, then the Nazis really had the idea that they're going to put this into very concrete and radical form. And one of the first things that they do uh, when they come to power, uh, within a bare six months when, when uh, Hitler comes to power, is to introduce a law for compulsory sterilization, the law for the prevention of progeny with hereditary diseases, uh, also called the hereditary health law was a compulsory sterilization law promulgated by the Hitler cabinet in uh, July of 1933, which orders the forcible sterilization of persons with certain afflictions, with certain diseases or disabilities. And here, if you see the slide here, uh, you'll see that there are nine specific uh, disabilities or diseases or disorders that are outlined in the law. Five of those diseases specifically designated legislation. Uh, so um, specifically designating uh, psychiatric or neurological disorders for which someone could be sterilized in Nazi Germany. And those include schizophrenia, manic depressive disorder, which was known as bipolar disorder at the time, a hereditary epilepsy, notice that I'm saying hereditary, hereditary again and again, uh, Huntington's chorea, which had a very, um, very elevated uh, hereditary component. If one of your parents had it, you had a 50% chance of getting this very degenerative and deadly disease. And finally, hereditary feeble mindedness. And when I give this lecture to physicians, they're kind of going, what's that? Uh, and they're right. But this was a scientific term at the time for what today we might see as a wide spectrum of developmental and intellectual disabilities. Uh, and finally, there were some uh, physical conditions that warranted sterilization under the new law, hereditary uh, deafness, hereditary blindness, uh, serious or severe hereditary physical deformity, and finally, severe alcoholism, which at the time, uh, many scientists and doctors in Nazi Germany thought, as some do today, uh, that alcoholism had an hereditary component. So now medical professionals are duty bound to report patients with these disorders that they see in their practice. And once a proposal comes from, uh, from parts of the medical community, denunciations of individuals also came from uh, social workers and teachers as well, not only from physicians, although most of them did come from physicians. So once a proposal to sterilize an individual is advanced, uh, to public health officials, this suit, it's a legal suit, and it now comes before what's called a special hereditary health court. Uh, and here you see one of those sitting hereditary health courts. Uh, sorry for the grainy photograph. Uh, and um, these are specially designed Nazi tribunals. They're a kind of Nazi legal invention superimposed on the um, Nazi or the, the, the existing, pre existing Nazi legal system. And there's something special about these hereditary health courts. And first, let me say just a little bit about uh, German justice uh, before 1945 that's important to know so that you can understand the makeup of these hereditary health courts. It's important to note that, unlike us, 
here in the United States and in Great Britain, uh, Germany before 1945 did not have a jury system. Um, most of Germany, uh, most of German states and then continental states in Europe had what they had, uh, what's known as basically continental law. Uh, the jury system we had have because we were a colony of Great Britain and they had a jury system, so we inherited that. So in Germany before 1945, you might be tried by a trained judge, one, or by a tribunal of judges. And they would decide whether you were guilty or innocent and give sentence. So here, what's different in these hereditary health courts, and there were about 250 health courts established throughout Germany by um, 1936, um, um, these hereditary health courts are made up not just of jurists as a normal uh, legal tribunal would be. Each one of these hereditary health courts made up of three individuals, one trained jurist and two physicians or psychiatrists, which means that the decision making really lies in the hands of the physicians or psychiatrists on that tribunal uh, as uh, they adjudicate these sterilization cases. Um, if the patient were judged a candidate for sterilization, the implementing decree of the 1933 law demands execution of that procedure within two or three weeks time at a designated local hospital or clinic that's mentioned in the verdict. There is a law, there's a paragraph of the law rather, that sanctions the use of force on unwilling victims. So those who try to circumvent the procedure are delivered under a uh, police guard to the hospital or clinic in question. So this new law goes into effect in January of 1933. And the most careful study that we have of available data suggests that between uh, the 1st of January, 1934 and wars end in Europe in May of 1945, that 400,000 Germans are forcibly sterilized under the terms of this Nazi sterilization law. The vast majority of those indeed in the first five years that the law is in place. Uh, after September 1939, when um, Nazi Germany goes to war with the invasion of Poland, this becomes very kind of um, uh, difficult to, uh, to carry out on such a vast scale as they had been during the, the peacetime uh, because doctors are needed at the front. So about 320,000 individuals are sterilized in that very short time frame between 1934 and September uh, of 1939, 400,000 uh, in the whole uh, time frame of, of uh, Nazi Germany. Uh, and this figure of 400,000 doesn't include the thousands of uh, concentration camp prisoners, Jews, uh, Roman Sinti, Poles, uh, who are every, literally every stripe of the prisoner population in the concentration camp system, sterilized extra legally in the Nazi concentration camps during the war years. So who are the victims of Nazi sterilization policy? For the most part, they are those individuals who suffer from conditions outlined in the law and a preponderance really in the case of those who are suffering from the mental disabilities outlined in that legislation. Uh, nowhere is this more true than in the case of hereditary feeble-mindedness uh, with about 50 to 60% of the sterilizations in any given year running under this uh, bailiwick of hereditary feeble-mindedness. This particular diagnosis was very ambiguous, very squishy, and it allows physicians, psychiatrists, public health officials to include not only those who have some significant intellectual disability or learning impairment, but also those people who stand outside the mores of German society, those who are socially aberrant as far as the Nazis are concerned, uh, vagrants, homeless people, prostitutes, uh, sexually promiscuous women, particularly if these persons were, on, were poor, on welfare, with illegitimate children, petty criminals, juvenile delinquents have trouble with school authorities and the police, and in increasingly large numbers as, uh, as relative to their size in the German population, Roman Sinti, so-called gypsies, were sterilized in large numbers uh, under this um, particular law. And so 
legalized compulsory sterilization then is the opening salvo in the attack on Germany's mentally and physically disabled, which continues throughout the first decade of the Nazi dictatorship. I'm just gonna warn you all, there's going to be a little bit of noise. My husband is scooping behind the scenes, behind the curtain, my husband is scooping up our little terrier and she's gonna protest. Trust me folks, no animals were hurt during this presentation. <laughs> Thank you for the interruption. <laughs> uh, thank you for your patience. So, um, so this then is sort of the opening salvo, this compulsory sterilization in the attack on Germany's mental and physically disabled uh, that continues throughout the first decade of the Nazi dictatorship. But as war nears and as racial and territorial policy begin to radicalize, in a really big way. And territorial policies with the coming of war in September 1939, uh, racial policies radicalizing, and we see that most scholars and historians of the period really see that sea change with Kristallnacht, the November pogrom, uh, national pogrom um, against uh, Jews in Germany. That sea change from sort of legislated discrimination against Jews uh, in Nazi Germany to extra legal terror, which uh, finally ends up with the deportation of German Jews to concentration camps, killing centers and ghettos in the East beginning in October of 1941. Um, but as these territorial and racial policies begin to radicalize, you begin to hear voices within the Nazi hierarchy. And here I must really suggest that it's the medical community. This is not especially Hitler's issue. Hitler is really interested in Jewish policy or anti-Jewish policy. It's, it's those German physicians uh, who are dedicated to sterilization policy, to eugenics, who begin to call for not just for the marginalization of individuals, uh, not just for the sterilization of people with disabilities, but for the elimination of these elements from German society Kind of uh, using the words of the time, calling them human ballast, right, on the ship of state to throw that ballast overboard as that country goes to war, to sacrifice them for the good of the German war effort. So this so-called euthanasia program is the National Socialist Regime's first campaign of mass murder, as I said. It precedes the final solution, uh, the genocide of European Jewry by about two years. And so in the spring and summer months of 1939, a number of planners led by Philip Buhler, uh, he was the head of Hitler's private chancellery called the Führer Chancellery. It handled Hitler's private affairs as Führer. And it was a party organization. It wasn't a state agency, it was a party, Nazi party, organization, and it's completely off the radar screens of most Germans at the time. So it's a perfect engine to run this clandestine murder operation. So Philip Buhler and Karl Brandt, uh, Hitler's attending physician at the time, richly deserving his place here in the dock at the Nuremberg doctor's trial in 1946. These two men and other physicians around Hitler begin to talk about a uh, child euthanasia program that's gonna target disabled children. And on the 18th of August, 1939, the Reich Interior Ministry circulates a decree that compels physicians and midwives. Remember in those days, lots of children, both here in the United States and in Germany are born at home. That's why midwives are included in the decree. These midwives and physicians are supposed to report newborn infants or children under the age of three who show signs of severe mental or physical disability. And once uh, the child euthanasia operatives are aware of the child, they begin to play kind of a carrot and stick game with the parents of these children. I should say that probably in our time too, but certainly in this time period, unless the child was very, very severely disabled, usually children under the age of three are still with their parents at home. And usually committal comes about the time that the child is ready for school age uh, because there was mandatory schooling uh, in um, 
Germany at the time. And so most parents would have committed their children at the time they reached school age because most institutions uh, gave what we would call special education. There was no mainstreaming students with disabilities in those days. And so most parents usually put their children in mental health facilities or care facilities at about the school age. So how to get those kids away from their parents that are still living with them at home. And as I said, they kind of play a carrot and stick approach with the children, uh, well, sorry, with the parents of, uh, of these children. And the carrot, okay, we have these special pediatric facilities. One of them very famously in Brandenburg, uh, which uh, Ruth mentioned at the beginning of the talk this evening. Uh, we have these special care facilities that are gonna offer the most up-to-date therapeutical treatments for your disabled child. If the parents don't respond, the stick, right? Oh, you don't have the best interest of your child at heart. We might have to consider removing the child from the home. Um, and so with this carrot and stick approach, beginning in October of 1939, children begin to come to these uh, special pediatric facilities, 31 of them throughout Germany that we know of. Uh, these are in reality children's killing wards. There's a period of observation, quote unquote observation, uh, where these children stay at one of these facilities and then they're usually murdered by overdose of narcotics or by starvation. At first, as I said, only infants and toddlers up to the age of three are included in this measure, uh, but finally uh, in the latter years of the euthanasia program, uh, the scope of the measure widens to include juveniles up to the age of 17. And by, so this begins then in October of 1939. And by January of 1940, just a few months later, an adult killing operation parallels those murders of disabled uh, German infants and children. And this um, effort takes its code name, Operation T4, from its street address of its central office in Berlin. Um, the, um, the, the small offices in the Fuhrer Chancery kind of outgrew, uh, sort of the, the staff kind of outgrew that very small office. And they took up a position in an Aryanized villa, a villa that had formerly belonged to Jewish owners and had been taken away in a very posh section of um, Berlin to be its nerve center. And the street address of that villa was Tiergartenstrasse 4. And so the code name of the operation for the, the adult euthanasia program becomes Operation T4. If you're a music enthusiast or you know Berlin, uh, that villa was hit in the last days of the war with a bomb. Uh, and today the German, the Berlin Philharmonic uh, now stands in about that place uh, in uh, the middle of Berlin. And so now utilizing a practice that's developed for the child euthanasia program, T4 planners begin in the autumn months of 1939 to distribute carefully formulated questionnaires to public health officials, to public and private hospitals and clinics, to care facilities, nursing homes, and so forth. And the directors of these facilities have to fill out these forms uh, kind of the sinister purpose is only suggested by the emphasis the questionnaire places on the patient's capacity to work, as well as the kind of patient that the director has to uh, kind of register. Uh, those suffering from significant mental or physical disability, those not of German or related blood, read here Jews, about 5,000 German Jews are murdered in the euthanasia program before the general deportation of uh, German Jews begins in October of 1941 to the East. Uh, the criminally insane, those who commit crimes under diminished capacity for which they are put in mental institutions rather than prisons. And those who are confined to the institution in question for more than five years, they're looking for long-term cases. So these registration forms are a few, uh, reviewed by specially appointed and recruited medical experts. Uh, we know the names of most of them, most of them psychiatrists, many of significant reputation who were specially recruited to this secret program. 
And beginning in January of 1940, those persons whose selection for the euthanasia program is confirmed by a central medical commission in Berlin are transported to one of six killing centers throughout Germany and Austria. You see, hopefully, the map of that there. Uh, among them, Brandenburg on the Havel, mentioned by Dr. Uh, Ruth in the beginning of our talk. Another very famous one, Hadamar uh, near Frankfurt, uh, one of the best known of these adult euthanasia facilities. And within hours of their arrival at one of these facilities, patients, uh, uh, transports of patients are selected for gassing are gassed in specially designed gas chambers that look like showers. Their dental gold is removed and their bodies are cremated in special crematory ovens. And if this sounds familiar to you, of course it should, because most historians agree that though this was not the intent at the time, the euthanasia program becomes kind of a dry run for the final solution, the genocide of European Jewry. Much of the gassing technology, uh, the specific crematory technology that's used, cremation was used as a funerary practice or uh, a funerary practice already in the 20th century in most of Northern Europe, but the specific crematory technology that, that is capable of incinerating hundreds and hundreds of bodies in a short time. The camouflage techniques that lure the patients and then uh, Jews into a sense of uh, false security in the very door of the gas chamber. All these that are formulated for the euthanasia program are seized upon by the planners of the final solution when they decide to murder Jews in stationary gas chambers in German occupied Poland. And there, that is one important link between this first program of mass murder and the more comprehensive genocide of European Jewry that we're uh, commemorating this evening with this program. And because this program is a secret one, there are all kinds of elaborate efforts taken to conceal its deadly designs. Although in every case, official records like death certificates are made up to indicate that these victims died of natural causes, supplying fictive or falsified uh, death certificates with false uh, uh, causes of death. Sometimes even the dates of death are doctored this euthanasia program quickly becomes an open secret. Uh, you'll be seeing the Hadamar euthanasia facility, which I mentioned. We've just seen the Hadamar gas chamber. And this euthanasia facility, Hadamar, did not sit out in the middle of nowhere. It was actually on a town, if you could perhaps tell from the photograph, on a town, uh, on a hill above the town of Hadamar, a small farming village. And uh, in these places, the local villagers would see those buses, blacked out windows with the buses coming through their streets uh, up to Hadamar, up to the care facility six days a week. Um, and shortly thereafter, uh, this pungent odor of flesh burning, which uh, is very peculiar. It doesn't smell like leaves burning or wood burning. It has a peculiar odor. And here in Hadamar, farmers complained because the ash was actually from the crematory was actually ruining their crop. And fearing public unrest at this very critical point in the war effort, uh, the German army had just invaded the Soviet Union that June. In August, late August of 1941, Hitler himself phones the leaders of the euthanasia program and tells them to halt the euthanasia operation for adults. And at this time, according to their own internal statistics, 70,273 institutionalized patients were murdered at these six euthanasia facilities. You notice that I give an exact number. That's because they kept such elaborate statistics for this murder campaign. So 70,273 murdered between January 1940 and August 1941, the vast majority of them German patients and non-Jewish patients. But this order to stop the euthanasia program was not an actual end to the killing as I might, as, as intimated by what I just said, the child euthanasia program continues as before through this so-called euthanasia pause. And more significantly, in the following summer, there's a drive to reinitiate the adult euthanasia program. And, and that really comes about in the summer of 1942 uh, into the second murder phase. 
from August 1941 to 1942, the planners are kind of trying to decide, do we go on? How do we knock out the kinks and make this program more covert? And what to do with the hundred or so personnel sitting on their hands during this pause? They were not returned to other facilities to work as uh, normal uh, nurses, doctors, and so on. What to do with these individuals? Well, the plan is that the final solution had the plan for that too. And basically about 100 T4 operatives or euthanasia operatives, all men, male nurses, one of the physicians, Imfred Abril, uh, and uh, a lot of the crematory staff known as stokers, some of the bureaucratic personnel are sent to German occupied Poland where they become the German staff um, at uh, three killing centers, Belzic, Sobibor, and Treblinka. Treblinka may be the killing center most familiar uh, to most of you in the audience. It's the end station of the Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, 925,000 Jews are murdered at Treblinka, almost as many as at Auschwitz. And who are the staff? The staff there in these three killing centers in Eastern Poland, are uh, the bulk of them are euthanasia operatives. Why? They're inured to the killing process. They're familiar with the gassing and crematory technology that's expanded upon to be used here. Uh, unlike Auschwitz, which used Cyclone B, uh, a, a very uh, potent gas uh, for, made from prussic acid, most of the killing centers actually employed carbon monoxide gas, just as they had in the euthanasia program. And that's what they do uh, at Belzic, Silverborn, and Jablinka. Uh, they're familiar with the crematory technology. They're uh, familiar um, with those camouflage tactics I mentioned. And they've shown themselves trustworthy in a secret uh, killing program on German soil where this clandestine uh, operation really is in complete violation of the German penal code. Uh, so they're going to be loyal in this much more systematic murder of European Jewry. And so, as I intimated before, in the summer of 1942, uh, killing facilities began uh, to murder again as it had a mark. Uh, and Kaufgorin, the slide will be seen, um, uh, in a more decentralized uh, effort to kill patients on German soil, uh, beginning in roughly August of 1942. Uh, this more decentralized phase has a few earmarks or hallmarks. Let's look at them very quickly before I wrap up. Um, there are a few things that are different from this, in the second killing phase, which goes from 1942 to May of 1945. Uh, that make it different than the first phase, January 1940 through August 41, which we'll call the gassing phase. In the second phase, they're using medical overdoses, lethal overdoses of medication, usually sedatives. Uh, that um, effort, that, that kind of killing um, method of killing that was very successful in child euthanasia, and it's now employed in adult euthanasia. Sometimes too, starvation is used. You're looking at the photograph of the Kaufbourgen uh, mental health facility. It's near Augsburg, uh, killing about 1,500 patients there between roughly 1942 to 1945, and it was one of the facilities that employed uh, starvation on a regular basis of its patients. Another change is that the doctors are no longer doing the killing per se. Uh, this is kind of how the killing operates at this particular time frame. Um, um, the, in, from 1942 to 1945, at most of these uh, 60 facilities that still uh, work uh, for the euthanasia program, for the T4 program, the doctor, the chief medical director goes through with his head nurse, male nurse and head female nurse uh, through the patient's uh, wards and picks 20 to 30 usually patients to be murdered that day. Instead of having a whole transport of 60 or 80 people come on a bus and be gassed, uh, they're picking patients who are already in the facility, although there are still transports coming to the facility and they're picking 20 or 30 a day to be murdered. So it looks less funny from the inside and from the outside. Um, and 
basically, instead of the physician gassing the patients, the T4 operation had a motto that the gas valve belonged in the hands of the physician. And that medicalizes the process, doesn't it, for both the victims and the perpetrators. And here, though, uh, this is where the nurses become involved in the killing process. Instead of gassing patients, they're now murdering patients on the evening shift at the time when sedatives would most likely be given to patients, right? Patients are agitated, you want them to sleep, so it doesn't look strange to give patients sedatives. And so you have um, 20 or 30 patients that are given lethal overdoses of medication every day. And it's interesting because it's this point in which uh, women are introduced to the killing process in Nazi Germany. Yes, it's true that there are female concentration camp guards uh, at places like Auschwitz and in Bergen-Belsen, Ravensbrück, but for the most part, these are concentration camp guards and they're not directly involved with the gassing at Aus places like Auschwitz or with shooting, as we talked about earlier with the Einsatzgruppen in the Soviet Union, but here, male and female nurses are actually doing the killing. And so for the first time, you have women being brought into mass killing in Nazi Germany. And finally, instead of that centralized six killing centers that we see for uh, the euthanasia program, Hadamar, Grafenegg, Brandenburg, and so on, now over 60 institutions are involved in the killing process. And I think what makes this so interesting to me is that if you're looking at a photograph of Kaufgorin, uh, this facility in many ways is exactly what it looks like from the outside. It is a facility that takes in fresh patients between 1942 and 1945. It cares for the patients uh, with varying degrees of um, therapy. There were very few therapies uh, available for patients in those days. There were no antipsychotic drugs. Uh, and it releases patients that show vast improvement or who are uh, considered cured. And so at the same time, though, in the same wards, you have individuals being murdered by the same staff, by the same, in the same wards. And so it's that juxtaposition of healing and killing uh, at places like Hadamar and other facilities that I find so interesting and keep me absolutely fascinated to this day. And I will stop there and invite your questions. Uh, thank you for your patience. Thank you, Patricia, very much. Um, I, uh, throughout, uh, throughout your talk, you, we, have, we received already several questions and I will just start um, uh, with, with the very first one uh, which came in. Um, uh, and it, it is especially about the organizational structure of, of these healthcare workers, whether they're part of the SS or paramilitary groups or by the independent civilian healthcare workers who acted in their regular daily practices following the Nazi standards of care. Yes. And actually, so and that was, was, I'm sorry, and there's another question which I think I, I would like to combine. It is about what happened to doctors who refused to take uh, part in the so-called euthanasia process? Those are really excellent questions. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, those are really excellent questions. So yes, um, these are not SS. Uh, these are doctors, nurses, uh, bureaucrats, public health officials that, as I said, both in the sterilization and euthanasia programs, they actually devise and implement these policies. You do not see the SS connected with them, except in the most marginal ways. Uh, that's not true of the, of course, of the killing centers in, in that I mentioned, Sobibor, Treblinka, and Belzic. But for these euthanasia centers, they are average doctors and nurses. And during the first killing center, remember, this is the gassing stage, and there's the stage from 42 to 45 where they're using usually medic, uh, so med lethal overdoses of medication. And in the first phase, the individuals who are perpetrators are actually recruited. So they have the right to say yes and no. And so people actually do say no. Uh, we know of, uh, of a few who are recruited for this. They're 
typically the staff for the first phase are brought to the, uh, to, they're brought to Berlin, they're sworn to secrecy, they're a group of them all together. They are told about the program and then they are given a chance to think about it and to say yes or no. And we know with one particular incident because he shared his, um, his um, experiences in the post-war, we knew that at least one of these individuals says, I can't, I have this moral compass, I'm a doctor. He went home, he told his wife, he says, I can't tell you why, the Gestapo is gonna come and arrest me tomorrow. He was actually concerned that they would, uh, you know, that they would come and arrest him for refusing. And um, indeed that didn't happen at all. We also know that um, you have uh, nurses who refuse at some point uh, to take part in this. Uh, during this second phase, the, it's more of a slippery slope because what happens is uh, some of these facilities that aren't already euthanasia facilities like Hadamar in the first phase, there's no more recruitment. One day the medical director says, we're gonna start killing patients here. And then sort of everyone is left to kind of deal with the situation as they see best. And so what you see, some people actually say no. Um, other, in other cases, you see nurses saying that they're pregnant uh, because in those days, many people after their first child, most women didn't have a career. Uh, you see uh, men who don't want to do this uh, uh, um, volunteering for the front, which was a serious consideration, right? It, you can stay home and be safe and kill people, or you can go out to the front and, and take considerable risk. And the dirty little secret of the Holocaust is this, we know of no one who said no, said no tenaciously. If you say no tenaciously enough, you will get out of fill in the blank, the euthanasia program, shooting in the Einsatzgruppen as a guard in a concentration camp, because one of the dirty little secrets of the Holocaust is there is always someone to take your place. So we actually have, uh, we have no proof that anyone was lost, you know, suffered life or limb as a result of the, um, you know, um, uh, refusing to go along with this program. Um. So I have a, a, a two more questions which I would like to combine before we uh, uh, slowly uh, close our, our session. Um, what, uh, were there more, uh, what is the rational uh, between women and men who were sterilized? Um, so, so were only women sterilized or also men? Um, and another question was um, the, about the medical staff. Uh, why did they falsify the course of death? I mean, um, and alas, but not least, a question about what what ha have the motivations of these health care workers been studied? And I, I believe you've done, uh, you looked into this as far as I know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, first, the first question about the ratio of men to women. Um, for, for the euthanasia program, I know, I know the question was about sterilization. For the euthanasia program, you really, uh, I, I actually have some information on that based on my own research because I've been looking at uh, patient records uh, for one of these facilities, the Kaufbornman uh, facility that you saw in the last photo. And we have a precious trove of patient files that are very rare uh, to have those so that we know who these people are. And the ratio for that is quite even. Uh, but sterilization was a greater ratio of women do get sterilized. Um, it's simple vasectomy for men, tubal ligation for women as a process uh, of sterilization, but it kind of evens out a little bit because men get sterilized. Uh, they have a much longer track record for which they can be sterilized, right? Women go into menopause and at a certain point, um, you know, in their 50s, and if they have, you know, one of these disabilities that you see in the law, they're no longer childbearing, so they're simply not sterilized. So that evens out the numbers a little bit. Does that make sense? Uh, the second question, why did the medical staff falsify these documents? So, um, so they're murdering people on German soil, and this is in direct violation of the German penal code. Uh, this is done in the highest secrecy. And the idea was to suggest that these individuals are murdered 
uh, sorry, that these individuals who were murdered died of natural causes. And during this gassing phase, you actually know individuals are actually allowed to visit their relatives in these facilities. Uh, the relatives of persons who are in mental health institutions are basically told, look, there's an epidemic that's going on at this facility and we can't let you visit this individual. Um, and so they really have a very uh, thick web of secrecy uh, and elaborate planning to see that this killing program is disguised. Remember, it's on German soil. The most um, European Jews that the Nazis murder in the genocide of European Jewry, they're murdered offside, out of the sight of the German population in German occupied Poland. Um, and uh, this is not so in the case of euthanasia. It's, it's kind of right there under their noses. And so they want to suggest that these individuals are dying of natural causes. And so the death certificates, uh, what typically happens is that a person's relatives, the next of kin of someone who, were, who would be murdered at this facilities, whether children or adults, they'd receive what was called a consolation letter. It was kind of a form letter that say, we're very sorry, but you're, this person has died at this, uh, at this facility. Uh, you can't visit right now because there's an epidemic. We are sending you the ashes of this individual uh, the, and, and the death certificate because you know for all kinds of reasons, you need a death certificate. And they falsify, they have a special, all of each of these killing centers actually had a registry office with the equivalent of like a county clerk's office. So they could, so they could doctor the death certificates that would be official. And so they put um, fictive causes of death, the most, the most common cause of death that's usually listed is pneumonia because that's something that everybody could get uh, and was common. And um, so, and they'd also sometimes uh, put in the fictive date of death, especially when they were gassing because you have 80 or 100 patients from one facility, you don't want to have them, you know, have the same date of death. What if they know someone else and they compare, right? So they stagger often the dates of death as well. And this is done from 42 to 45 as well to disguise the idea that these individuals have died at this terrible, tragic death. And they actually send back the possessions of this person because that's what you would do if someone died of pneumonia in one of these facilities. So it's a very elaborate effort to keep this under wraps. Um, the final question was, what can you remind me again, Ruth? Um, it was uh, about the motivation of the healthcare workers. And I would right. like to add a real final question. And then I, uh, okay. uh, it was about if, if uh, any uh, healthcare workers were punished or uh, put to trial after the war. I think that's a really important question. Maybe yeah. a, a good question to end our talk. Yeah. So um, the... Um, the motivation about the motivation. Them. I'm sorry, I can't read my own handwriting. <laughs> um, so the motivation um, there, I think it's the case with most Holocaust perpetrators, but especially in this area, there are about as many motivations as there are perpetrators. But there are some basic common denominators. Some believed in um, eugenics ideas and firmly bought into this. Um, some um, were strictly, um, you know, concerned with their careers, especially the physicians that operated in the euthanasia program. I have to say that the vast majority of physicians who participated in this program were very young men. Um, I think Carl Brandt was in his mid thirties or late thirties when he died in 1940. I believe he was executed in 47. Uh, so, so he's the leader and of, of the euthanasia program. So you really, the Nazis kind of, uh, kind of had an industrial kind of um, um, they they lowered sort of the ages and the restrictions for. Um, physicians getting their licenses and things like this because of the wartime. They wanted more physicians to kind of pump them out. And so many of these physicians, as I said again, were, were very young. And so 
I think many of these physicians thought they would get ahead if they um, worked in this particular field. In view of the nurses, we know that this was medicine was a very hierarchical uh, kind of structure in those days where the doctors were really gods in white coats, as many of the nurses talked about in the trials after uh, the war. And really to have said no to a physician would have been very difficult. Uh, so there's a lot of that going on. Uh, we also see physicians and nurses, um, you know, in the case, uh, we see some of them saying, uh, look, these individuals were, were very severely disabled and it was really a mercy death. You see that uh, said sometimes. Um, and in some cases you see, particularly among physicians, the idea that we have these, just as I said, talking about eugenics to start with, we have these very limited resources. Here we are at war, we have limited resources. Uh, we, why don't we get rid of the incurables so we can cure those who can be cured? And so there are all kinds of motivations, and those are just some that tend to be very common that come out in the post-war. Almost no one, and I, let me just get to that final idea of, of the trials. Um, there were uh, significant trials of euthanasia, euthanasia perpetrators after the war. Um, um, after an initial effort of the allies, first uh, with the Nuremberg doctors trial, uh, very few actual euthanasia perpetrators are tried in the doctors trial, despite the fact that the lead defendant is Karl Braun, the head of the euthanasia program, the only one to have survived the war. Uh, um, most of the Nuremberg doctors trials actually focused on something I didn't really discuss tonight because it was not state policy, uh, medical experimentation, of course, the crime which most um, Nazi doctors are associated with. And so really the bulk of the medical trial really focuses on medical, inhumane medical experimentation. And after an initial effort by um, an American uh, occupation authority to try a euthanasia offense in October of 1945, they had in their custody the Hadamar staff. They discovered that according to international law under which they had to operate, there was no statute by which they could try Germans who had killed their fellow Germans. Today, we can do that in crimes like, uh, in trials and tribunals like The Hague, we can try people uh, who killed their own populations in the former Yugoslavia. But in those days, there was no statute under international law for which to do that. That statute comes with that crimes against humanities statute uh, in Nuremberg. And until you have that Nuremberg, that first Nuremberg trial, it's not part of international law. They had no precedence with which to do it. And so the allies, the four major allies, uh, the United States, Great Britain, France and uh, the Soviet Union decide that euthanasia trials should be held by reconstructed West German and East German courts. And so uh, those begin in early uh, January, February, 1947, uh, reconstructed West, what would be eventually West German courts begin trying. They try, um, there are about 50 trials between 1947 and 1960. Uh, and at first the trials are very, very stringent with strict sentences. There were death sentences. A few were carried out before the basic law, uh, the law in West Germany, that's the German new West German constitution, which outlawed capital punishment. There were some executions of these doctors, but what happens is starting really in 1948, West German and even East German courts began to follow the lead of the occupying allies. Uh, when those allies left in 1948, you know, they, they're trying in their zones of occupation, France, French zone, British zone, American zone, they're trying uh, people for Nazi offenses. But by 1948, they all want to go home. They want to leave East West Germany alone. They want West Germany to be part of NATO, right? We're worried about the Soviets at this point. The Americans are. And this, these trials are extremely unpopular. And so they begin, American occupiers begin these 
extensive clemency policies, really clemency, pardoning, not pardoning, but reducing sentences of people with extremely dirty hands, not just youth, you know, not the euthanasia offenses, but people who were in, you know, uh, committing uh, atrocities, uh, committing in concentration camps and killing centers. And what happens is particularly West Germany, but East Germany too, follows this example. By 1948, 1949, you really don't see strict sentencing. You see many of these physicians acquitted. And then kind of in the 1960s, there's a renewed effort to try these individuals. So, you know, in the 1960s, you have a new generation. People are wondering, they're rejecting the Nazi past, and there's a renewed effort to try these people, especially in West Germany. And then what happens is really kind of frightening because what happens is um, that, as you know, the medical profession, like many others, is kind of a guild. They protect each other. And so what happens is, as in the 1960s, these, these people have aged a little bit, it's been 20 years, and what starts to happen is, is a, a physician is called in for a euthanasia offense, and he brings into court with him a document, whoops, document, and it says, uh, I, I am not fit to stand trial. He's got another doctor to say that he's not fit to stand trial for physical or mental reasons. Now, of course, doctors can do this for each other and kind of safeguard each other from trial. I'll just give you an example. There's a man by the name of Georg Reno. He was, uh, he was a gassing physician who killed thousands of people with his own hands, gassing them. Uh, and he, um, in the midst of his trial in the 1960s, he has an appendicitis attack. They rush him to the hospital, they take out his appendix, he's good to go. They put him back in court and he comes in with that slip of paper and he says, you know, this new, this appendicitis that I've had weakened my heart. And some doctor has written this up, this, this nonsense. And he says, I'm not fit to stand trial now. And indeed, they put this proceedings aside. And according to German law, they revisit that every six months for three or four years. And at a certain point, I believe five years, they put the proceedings aside. And this happened in the case of Reno and the case of dozens of other um, euthanasia perpetrators. And in the case of Reno, he died in the early 2000s. So he was not dying in 1960, I can tell you that. Um, he lived a long and happy life and he was never tried again for those offenses. So that's what happens to the, the bulk of these individuals. And one of the great architects of um, child euthanasia, a man by the name of Werner Cattell, most of them, just like him, goes back to his old practice. Uh, Cattell was a, a physician at a, um, at a university, and he even endows with his death, he endows a prize uh, in his name. Uh, and thank goodness the university finally decides not to take that endowment in his name. But um, you know, most of these people simply step back to their old careers. Um, Patricia, thank you so, so, so much. I think that you, you, uh, there were so many topics uh, and, and, and so, uh, and I'm sorry that we couldn't answer all the questions you've posed, but we're really, really grateful for you giving us um, an insight into this, uh, yeah, horrible crime history um, um, uh, as part of um, the German Nazi Reich. Thank, thanks a lot for, for taking us there. You're very welcome, it was my pleasure.